Good morning. So we're going to talk a little bit about how um, uh, biology has evolved uh, information in a way that uh, maybe information technologies we can learn from. And biology uh, uses uh, information to communicate between cells. So if you will, cells talk to each other with APIs. And some of the ways that uh, information flows through biology might give you some ideas about the future of APIs and how they evolve. And so about four billion years ago, um, uh, life started on, on this planet. And uh, early came uh, single cells and then uh, uh, more complex cells that had uh, a nucleus and, uh, and a membrane. And the communications between the uh, cells and within the cells are chemical. And the way things fit together are essentially uh, chemicals uh, fitting into a receptor or acting on something in, in a similar way as, as APIs plug together. And so after a, a couple billion years, cells organized into multicellular organi organisms, uh, sort of like a corporation, perhaps. And the uh, multi-cells um, uh, started to differentiate in that some became li livers and teeth and, and so forth. And uh, the similar sorts of things might be happening with humans. And about half a billion years ago, um, eyes and brains um, were invented. And this allowed um, organisms to see each other and make decisions about uh, whether something was a predator or prey. Uh, and, and it was a way, another channel of communications besides chemical in that it allowed optical and it, it introduced memory and allowed processing to decide what to do based on what information was there. And then uh, um, uh, about two million years ago, um, uh, uh, humans invented uh, tools, essentially, or animals as well, like beavers building dams with sticks, uh, in that uh, tools were something in addition to the biological structure that is the organism. You could pick up, uh, for example, a, a, a stick or a rock and do things uh, to your environment that uh, uh, couldn't be done with your bare hands. And then uh, an important innovation um, uh, around that time was the invention of grandmothers. And grandmothers uh, are uh, pretty unique to human species in that uh, most species, the um, uh, individuals remain fertile uh, until they die. And uh, grandmothers uh, are essentially mothers that uh, live for a, at least a whole other generation. And it's an introduction of, of memory across time and the ability of the, um, the previous generation to help uh, their offspring and their offspring's offspring to survive. And so this was beneficial to uh, selection and the survival of, of, a, of a gene line and uh, an important ev evolution that is not really in other primates and not in, in most other animals. And uh, the next uh, important innovation that, that came with uh, humans was uh, control of fire, in that fire is a naturally occurring phenomenon, but the ability to control it, the ability to start it, the ability to carry it across time were important ev uh, evolutionary steps that allowed cooking food which allowed uh, higher nutritional value uh, and uh, eliminating parasites by cooking um, and improved the survival of, of uh, humans. And uh, an extension of that is essentially electricity, which allowed um, uh, the um, uh, lighting and heating and communications, such as the internet, and as is, is an ex extremely controlled version of fire, if you will. Um, and it's something that was done in real time until essentially batteries were invented. But it's, a, um, it's another tool that has led to the uh, extension of the species and the industrial revolution and the internet and, and other important developments that have uh, brought us more or less where we are today. And Sundar Pichai, who's the current CEO of Google, says the next evolutionary um, uh, development for humans that may be as important as either fire or electricity is AI, which is essentially uh, electricity with memory and learning. And so the, like the uh, brain evolving in biology, 
This is a brain evolving uh, in information systems, um, and it's, uh, it's something will have a, a big impact on the way society functions and organizes on a going forward basis. And so cells um, have a, an immune system. So inside a cell there are um, uh, um, memory um, uh, things that recognize when a cell's been in, invaded by a virus, for example, and the um, um, memory uh, can see the pieces of virus that it has seen before uh, and remember uh, to recognize them and know to chop them up uh, if they are being attacked again. And th this is where the um, biochemical mechanism called CRISPR has come from. It is the immune system and the memory from cells, and it can be used to recognize pieces of DNA, chop them up, and, and reassemble them in different ways. And that uh, is being used for modifying the genetics of, of plants and animals and, and humans, even. Uh, and that recently, uh, CRISPR has been used to, to create designer babies in China, uh, or human babies, that is. And it's also being used for many other applications. But its origin is essentially the memory and the immune system from cells. And so in a multicellular organism, there's another level of immune system of how there's the cells that are connected together, and then they start to differentiate. But a mechanism has evolved that to recognize uh, cells that are invading or misbehaving, like a, a cancer cell, and essentially um, uh, neutralize them. And this is something that uh, um, has happened within a cell, then in groups of cells in a multicellular organism. And it's maybe evolving in humans, where uh, humans are more or less are individuals that collect together, kind of like sponges or coral cells, but uh, they're not too differentiated, although there are doctors and lawyers and engineers, and they specialize in different things and kind of rely on each other to be a complete system. And there's an immune system for society and cultures that have evolved, essentially the police and the laws and, and so forth. And this is a... Uh, a mechanism that um, the uh, conduct of, of individuals is somewhat controlled uh, to keep the overall organism surviving. And so the, as you apply AI to this immune system that is controlling uh, the cells in a society or the individuals, uh, that you're recognizing individual um, behaviors and conduct and deciding whether or not to allow that uh, to continue or to in some way neutralize it. And what's evolved in society is kind of a, a police system and a judicial system and an appeal system so that there's essentially a, a way to uh, uh, respond if you feel you're being mistreated and, and, uh, and society agrees this is a good thing. But as the uh, uh, edges of this system become smarter and more automated and, and more lethal, uh, for example, the, the police will shoot somebody who's shooting the population uh, without a trial or a jury or, or such things. So it's uh, a distributed, decentralized control system that has uh, effects that uh, maybe uh, um, would be uncomfortable for people to, to acknowledge that, that this is happening. And so there's other ways that uh, APIs, and, and in this case blockchains, uh, are a lot like biology, or the information that flows um, uh, through the system and, and between elements of the system. And that blockchains um, are something that's evolved relatively recently, in the last 10 years or so, as, uh, as an extension to internet protocols that were sort of left out of the early internet protocols that uh, uh, because of uh, resource constraints, and that it introduces an element of trust from which you can uh, do money um, and uh, creates a, a API protocol for what is the truth, and not the objective truth, but at least the truth that the different parties who were conducting a transaction agreed upon at the time. And then that's recorded into, into a ledger that uh, is, can be trusted over time as to, well, at least what did people agree on. And so there's uh, something like this was uh, evolved about 500 years ago, which is double entry accounting, where uh, the debits and the credits of, of you are recorded, and if the uh, totals of all of your um, debits don't add up to the total of all of your credits, odds are there's a mistake and you need to go back and check where that mistake is. 
and then the parties can transact with more trust that there's kind of double, triple error checking uh, as to what is the flow of money, what is the accounting of it, and so forth. And the addition of blockchain to that is essentially triple entry accounting, where you still have the double entry accounting of my accounting, your accounting, and then we both agree to write our um, opinion of the transaction into a blockchain that uh, is uh, persistent over time in a, in a trusted, immutable way. And so you essentially get a higher level of fidelity and a higher level of trust of the information flow between individuals or, or entities. And so this triple entry accounting ledger is essentially the truth. And it might be public, like a public blockchain, or it might be private, uh, that's just between the parties. Um, and, but in either case, it's, a, uh, it's an objective measure of the truth of the parties involved across time that is immutable. And uh, uh, more than 20 years ago, um, uh, this type of thing, a, a cryptographic hashtag um, mechanism of keeping track of uh, agreements, uh, was uh, uh, already a commercial product, in, in that a company, Surety, would keep track of all of the transactions for a week. Uh, if you registered for the system, they would take all those transactions and uh, uh, reduce it into a hashtag, and they would publish the hashtag in the lost and found section of the New York Times newspaper, which prints millions of newspapers. And they would do this every week, and so, if any modification to any of the pixels in any of the transactions of that week were changed, the hashtag, the new hashtag would be different than the one that was published. So you can go back and look and say, well, are these consistent? And you can use that as a mechanism to say, well, this uh, transaction we did three years ago or 10 years ago uh, has uh, changed or is consistent with what was agreed on at the time. And so the interesting thing about um, that hashtag mechanism in the printed paper newspapers uh, is that in Satoshi Nakamura's white paper about uh, the design of Bitcoin, um, uh, three of the eight um, references that he cites are actually citing surety in the way that that uh, hashtag mechanism works. And so it's kind of uh, uh, Bitcoin's blockchain is derivative of, of that uh, technique. And there's other examples from history of how uh, cryptography and, and other uh, things to keep track of data and its immutability have evolved. And so information um, takes energy to, uh, to replicate. And uh, in biology, information across generations is stored in DNA. And so a, a human genome, uh, like my genome, uh, in a in computer format is, is about one and a half gigabytes in size. It's three billion uh, base pairs of DNA letters that uh, are replicated from generation to generation. And this is the code, the biochemical code, of, of what is an individual, whether it's a human or other species. And uh, uh, Bitcoin's blockchain is already 150 gigabytes in size, substantially bigger than a human genome, and uh, increasing in size at an exponential pace. And one of the differences uh, is that um, uh, a blockchain uh, saves all of the information about every transaction and replicates it every time. And so this is increasing in size and will continue to. And a new block is written roughly every 10 minutes. And if it takes longer than that, the algorithm gets easier um, to speed it up. And if it goes faster than that, the algorithm gets harder to slow it down. So pretty much uh, over the uh, 10 minute uh, writing per block will be consistent for the next 100 years or so. And so you can predict fairly accurately what the size of the blockchain is going to be um, in years in the future and, the, uh, and, and make uh, sort of predictions about what's necessary to do the uh, blockchain calculations. And so the um, uh, blockchains are a decentralized, distributed, uh, borderless system that are talked about as like a a uh, unique thing or a new thing, and, and it's a, a self-replicating a system in that the blockchain is, is reproduced with each uh, 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 transaction. Um, and then the, it's a framework that, uh, of how the information is, is retained accurately, and it's a protocol for how the information is, is uh, transmitted across time. And something else that is like this uh, turns out to be genetics, in that 
uh, uh, bio biochemical genetics and the DNA replication is a decentralized distributed system in that there isn't a central bank or a central regulatory agency of genetics that uh, the individuals do peer-to-peer -peer transactions that are reconciled when the populations converge or not and the uh, information is, is replicated um, between the individuals uh, as they reproduce. And so this replication of, of information uh, across time and space uh, takes energy. And in the case of uh, uh, blockchains, the energy, uh, at least in Bitcoin's case, is a proof of work, which takes a lot of electricity to, and compute power to, to calculate. And there are other techniques that are like proof of stake that are more efficient and faster. But in either case, it takes energy to do mining. And so this graph in the center is sort of the amount of compute power which correlates to the amount of energy to replicate the blockchain. As you can see, it's growing at a very uh, exponential pace. And in biology, the energy comes from predation or food or photosynthesis, and that's uh, the necessary parallel of, of how do you reproduce this information across generations, uh, either using uh, biochemical energy or, in the case of blockchains, using electrical energy. And so uh, species of different kinds of uh, animals um, uh, are essentially like different kinds of, of blockchains or even different kinds of APIs, if you will, um, in that if you were to um, uh, uh, step your shoe onto a Petri dish, there would be creatures living on the bottom of your shoe, and they would grow, and they would be differentiated. They might be closely related to each other, but they would be many different species that... Uh, have slightly different characteristics and grow in slightly different ways, but they're uh, pretty much all based on DNA. And, uh, and you can see the uh, diversity of, of species that have evolved in nature in the ecosystem. And the equivalent of that in essentially blockchains or uh, similar things is that uh, this is the, the last couple years of uh, the different kinds of blockchains that have evolved uh, essentially different mechanisms like Ethereum and, and so forth that uh, are like different species that are related to um, the Bitcoin's blockchain but uh, have slight variations and different uh, characteristics. And so they're much like different biological species that will survive or fail based on the unique characteristics that they have. And so natural selection is the sort of Darwinian definition of how these things are selected for. And so if you have a, a blockchain that uses a lot of energy, that might be unfavorable or uh, large amounts of information that might be really good for doing real estate transactions that don't need to be fast, but uh, really bad for doing, uh, for example, par parking meter transactions, which need to be fast and simple. And so the different kinds of uh, blockchains and different kinds of APIs will survive or fail based on how well they fit in the ecosystem and might be replaced by one that's better optimized for that. And so uh, the, the question would come up, well, will blockchains evolve into one, or will APIs even evolve into one uniform standard for like your company uh, that then branches in, or is a diversity of, of, uh, of different kinds of APIs or different kinds of blockchains favored? And in biology, the um, uh, diversity is favored, and that a monoculture or a standardization uh, is unfavorable. So if, if you're wondering if, if something like APIs or blockchains are going to consolidate into one uniform standard like TCP IP uh, that uh, everything flows through, or if it's more likely to evolve into, say, web pages or uh, applications, mobile applications or APIs where there's millions of different ones, uh, natural selection strongly favors um, diversity as in terms of the survival in, a, in an ecosystem. Next slide. Um, and so monoculture is, is where all of the uh, different organisms are, are standardized in one uh, uh, common format. So, for example, uh, um, in Ireland uh, at, at one time, all of the potatoes in the whole country were clones of each other. And, uh, and what happened is a parasite evolved that wiped out that particular genetic uh, sequence of organism 
uh, and it, it wiped out all of the living potatoes in the whole country at one time, where in most countries there's a diversity of, of, of that and it's more stable, where you might lose some of your APIs, but not all of them. Next slide. Next slide. And so one of the um, ecosystem changes that, uh, uh, for example, the kinds of blockchains that are used for ICOs, which were thriving over the past year, have essentially uh, becoming extinct because the regulatory environment of the ecosystem has changed to uh, um, essentially say anything that has those characteristics, the ecosystem is going to kill off. And so the... Uh, the uh, the species of blockchains that are used for ICOs are essentially going extinct at a rapid pace. Uh, however, others are surviving, so private blockchains for keeping track of, of logistics or supply chains or, or tickets or, or other sorts of information uh, are, are expanding in their use. And this creates an ecosystem with many different kinds of species, just like has happened in biology, in that uh, essentially there's the tree of life, um, which are plants and animals and fungi and microbes, and they each are related, but they uh, have slightly different uh, um, optimization for the particular niche that they're in, even though they coexist in an ecosystem. And so here's a, a graph of, of all the different species of life across four billion years, and they have a common ancestor in, in DNA, uh, and they've uh, diversified across millions of different species, uh, that are related to each other, more or less like cousins or siblings, and that uh, uh, we're related to fungi, but we're obviously different. Um, and the, uh, um, this is happening to APIs and happening to software and happening to blockchains. Uh, and so it's, it's the kind of thing that creates a, uh, an evolutionary path where everything is related, um, uh, but evolving. And what happened um, about half a billion years ago with the invention of eyes and brains, as I mentioned, is there was the ability of an, in, an individual organism that used to communicate uh, chemically or tactically with near, nearby neighbors uh, to have eyes to be able to see, um, essentially, uh, other, uh, other types of species and created the possibility of predators and prey. And uh, this led to a, uh, an explosion of diversity in that the surviving organisms um, uh, either were predators or prey or had their own uh, uh, life cycle. And it created all kinds of different niches um, that uh, uh, species evolved into. And this may well happen in the future uh, for example, APIs or blockchains that can see across each other and, and uh, either benefit or, or, uh, or um, predate on, on the uh, other organisms. And the, the, that uh, um, sensors to see across the, into the ecosystem also is coupled with brains and processing and, and somewhat intelligence and memory to decide what to do about those. So effectively AI uh, being introduced into a system. And so what is a, a person today um, is becoming more and more information uh, and, and uh, in proportion less uh, biochemical. So the genetics of me is only part of who I am today. Uh, there's also everything I've eaten, what I've learned from my parents and in school, uh, what's my medical record, what's my credit history, what's my social media postings. So the, the definition of, of me or you is, is a lot more digital information now, and the digital information is growing faster because the amount of information that can be uh, replicated in, in genetics is limited and the amount of information that can be reliably replicated uh, electronically is much greater. And so essentially we are information, increasingly electronic information, and our life experience is changing from something that we live in the physical reality to the electronic reality. And so our life experience is uh, not static information, but the information is changing, both the ecosystem that we're in and uh, the information that makes up us. So like a wave where you're surfing on a wave, the water doesn't go sideways, it just goes up and down. The energy of the wave grows across the ocean, 
and the life experiences surfing on this change of information that, uh, about ourselves and about the uh, ecosystem that we're in. And so this is a trend that's continuing uh, to uh, affect both electronic uh, um, versions of, of biological life and essentially uh, intelligent versions of electronic life that are starting to evolve. And so in these ways, blockchains are like biology and uh, blockchains are APIs. And so there's some of these kind of ideas can be applied to uh, APIs as, as well as biology, as well as evolution, as well as life in general. So thanks. <laughs>